Kenneth W. Royce, welcome back to the show. Glad to be back. Thanks, Brett. So we had you on a few years ago to talk about your book, Volume 1 in a series called Modules for Manhood. And for those, of, right. for those who aren't familiar with the series, uh, what is the overarching goal of this series of books you're putting out called Modules for Manhood? Well, it's basically to fill in the gaps of uh, males who aren't quite yet men. And becoming a man is, is a process. And there's always something to learn, something to hone, something to do better at. But these days, a lot of uh, young males didn't have uh, father figures, uh, grandfathers, uncles, or even an older brother to kind of help them show the way. So as an author, I'm trying to do my part in helping them to fill in the gaps, the so-called modules. And uh, there's about 42 of them that I came up with. And volume two covers, uh, I think, 13 through 25. All right. And uh, I think it's interesting, you quote Jeff Cooper, the famous marksman, right? Pistol fighter, gunfighter. Sure. Um, and he says that it's about these skills that you're trying to teach, is learning, teaching young men how to cope with the world around them. And what, what do you and what does Cooper mean by coping with the world around you? Jeff Cooper, just before he died in 2006, outlined a whole list of things that he thought a young man should know how to do before he leaves his father's household. And Cooper thought the father was primarily responsible for inculcating these things, you know, such as knowing how to fight, knowing how to uh, manage money, knowing how to cook a meal, how to camp out on his own, uh, speaking foreign languages and so forth. So, uh, you know, coping with the world is something a man should be able to do and not have to ask for help for every little thing. So, so he has all these different skills and it's an impressive amount of skills. It's like, yeah, you said fighting, learning a foreign language, things like that. But you also have things like, you know, a, a young man should learn how to fly a plane, ride a motorcycle. Let's say you're a young man and you're like, man, that looks awesome. I want to learn how to do all these things. But I didn't learn those when I was, a, you know, a youngster, a kid, or, you know, in my 20s. How do you find the time if you're in your 30s or your 40s? How do you find the time and also the money? Because this stuff, you know, oftentimes takes money to learn. How do you find the time and money to learn these skills? Well, people tend to find buddy who's watching or gaming or, you know, uh, addicted to screen to entertainment has plenty of time available if they'll drop, you know, that stuff and go learn real skills. So uh, another way to find the time is to start waking up a half an hour or an hour earlier a day. You know, basically, if you get serious about learning something, you'll, quote, find the time. The time is there. You know, are you there? That's the question. <laughs> right. And, and what about the money issue? Well, um, again, you know, learning to fly, that's the most expensive thing that you mentioned. To become a private pilot will cost you about nine or $10,000 plane, the certified flight instructor, your books, and so forth. And that's a lot of skill for not a whole lot of money. Uh, you know, I quote in, in the introduction of, of all the modules, a young man who was 17, and by the time he was 17, he had already bought a powered parachute, which is about the cheapest way to get into aviation, and become became a licensed uh, sport pilot for that. So, you know, this young man as a junior in high school was already an aircraft owner and already a pilot, and he did it by mowing lawns. He mowed acres and acres and acres of lawns for the previous two or three years and saved his money. So that's one example of how it can be done. Right. So yeah, time and money, if it's there if you if you just take the initiative to find it. Oh, sure. Um, and let's say you're a dad, right? You know, Cooper thought that, you know, these skills should be taught by fathers to sons. What if you're a dad and you don't know how to do half the stuff? Like you want to teach your son like how to be efficient, how to cope, but you, you're still trying to figure that out yourself. How do you impart those skills when you're still trying to figure it out on your own? Well, you know, one, one way to do it is to fake it until you make it. You know, however incomplete the dad is, he certainly knows more about whatever, you know, subject than the son probably does. So, you know, the dad needs to ramp it up and then teach to the son what he knows as he knows it. When I was in college, for example, I would take a course and the next semester I would tutor it. And I never claimed to be an expert, but I knew, I knew more about the subject than my students did, even though I just learned it a semester ago. So, you know, fake it till you make it. Right. You know, a child will respond to, to any kind of good instruction. And I think, I think sons are fair. They know that fathers aren't omnipotent and omniscient, 
but what counts is the effort. So, you know, dads need to, to bear down and fill up the modules. So that, that, that leads me, this idea of teaching your son leads me to one of the modules you cover, one of the very, fir- the very first one, in fact, in volume two is this, um, is teaching. And why do you, why do you think it was such teaching is such an important skill for men to have that you, you made it one of those modules? Well, you know, men should be examples of to others for their family and for society. And part of being a good example is being able to impart what you know how to do and what you know in your head. And so there's a certain process, a certain way to be a teacher. You know, teaching is a science and an art. And so I thought it important to describe what it is to teach, what's involved. And basically, anybody is a teacher if they can show someone to do something quicker than that student could learn to to do it on their own. And the other reason it's important to know how to teach is because you really don't know something until you've taught it. That's the final examination for any skill is if you can impart it to someone else. And as you do so, you're going to learn more about that skill or that knowledge set than than you did before uh, when you weren't teaching it. So it's the final way to know that you've you've, owned something is if you can teach it. Yeah, that second point, I think, goes back to that question about if you're a dad and you don't know this stuff, how do you teach it to your kid? Well, like teach it to your kid and that you're going to learn how to do it, right? Yeah. And there's some things dads could go, Hey son, I'm, I'm not real, you know, up to speed on this, but you know, let's go fishing together. I'm no great fisherman, but uh, I know a little bit about it from my dad and my grandfather. Let's go fishing. Well, we'll learn some of it together. And that's good for the relationship because it's more of a partnership, you know, in, in that learning experience versus dad being always the authoritarian teacher and the son always the student, you know, once in a while, and some things it's good that they both learn it together, and the son knows that they're learning it together. Yeah, I think it sets a great example for your son. It's like, look, my dad is 30, 40, and he's still learning. Like, it's his education didn't stop with school. Right. So another aspect that you model you call out in volume two is time management. And as we mentioned earlier, if you want to cram in all this stuff, learn all this stuff, these modules, you have to manage your time effectively and efficiently. So I mean, what's your approach to time management and productivity that you lay out in the modules for manhood? Well, you've got to realize that uh, everyone has the same amount of time in a day, whether it's Warren Buffett or someone who's destitute on the streets. They've all got 24 hours in a day. And so we're given a resource every day of a, of a new day. And I say yesterday is a canceled check. Tomorrow is a promissory note, but today is cash. So how you spend today to the minute, you know, once you get uh, really efficient and uh, vigilant about it, will add up to a real life versus if you fritter your time away, you're not going to have much of a life. You're not going to be effective. You, you, you won't have goals that are fulfilled. Uh, you won't attract a quality mate. You won't have a good career. So uh, you've you've got to consider the wealth that you're given every day when you wake up in the morning. I've got a full day that I can spend like cash in the bank or cash in my wallet. So uh, you've got to drop the unimportant things. You've got to start with the important things and start with A. Start with stuff that has to be done that's important or urgent and and tackle that immediately. I had a quick vignette when I got online uh, one time at a coffee shop. And instead of tackling the day's business, I you know went to some fun emails and told some jokes and looked at some JPEGs and all that. And I could have finished my business had I started with my business, but no, I, I played instead of worked. And I never forgot that. And so uh, I always remind myself, start with the A's, not with the C's. Yeah. I mean, I, I love that analogy of time as money. I mean, we often hear time is money, but like really thinking of your time as money and spending it like that, it, it really drives home like, man. And also like that money is going to go away, right? Like this is cash that disappears at the end of the day, uh, will help you manage better. You also uh, quote Hemingway where he famously said, you know, never confuse motion for action. Oh, that's a great quote, yeah. Any examples, in, maybe from your own life or from just your observation of other men of how they confuse motion for action? Well, a lot of people, men and women, claim to be busy. And I put busy in, you know, if you can hear the quotation marks in my voice. And they're in motion, but are they getting important things done and getting important things done right? You know, that's really the question. Uh, you know, it's easy to spend a day somehow. The day will go whether, <laughs> whether you want it to or not, it will go away. But what did you get done? What did you accomplish? You know, you should have some goals in mind, general goals, and then those are localized to the day, 
to within hours or even minutes within that day. You take a, a tycoon, I forget his name, but he's, he's a Chinese billionaire, and his day is planned by every 15 minutes. You know, quarter of the hour is blocked out. You know, this is a man that, that knows what his time is worth and, and gets stuff done. So, you know, are we in motion? Are we moving stuff around just to move it around or touch something once, especially a piece of paper? Touch it once, reply to that letter, finish the task that that uh, piece of paper demands, throw it in the trash, whatever, but touch it once, get it done, and then move on to the next task. Don't keep rearranging things on your desk, you know, moving it a little bit here and then two hours later a, a little bit there. Touch it once and, and, and get it done. So that that's action versus motion. And speaking of time management, there's a really interesting movie called In Time, and it's basically where, where the currency of the society is uh, based on time. And you're born with, uh, you're guaranteed, I think, 25 years. And then after that, you know, have you added to your time account in your first 25 years? If not, you clock out and you die. And uh, it's a fascinating concept. The movie is pretty well done. It could have been uh, uh, better, but it's good enough to, to be an attractive presentation of that concept. And they've got a little digital clock on their forearm. He's got 100 years and he gives it away. And uh, that causes all sorts of interesting problems. Right. Um, yeah, I think it's Justin Timberlake is in that movie, if I remember correctly. That's right. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and I love the, the touch at once. I mean, that came from, I remember, David Allen from Getting Things Done advocates that as well. That's right. And uh, you talk about getting things done. If, you have, if you're listening to this podcast, haven't read Getting Things Done or GTD, how it's often referred to. Right. Great book. Highly recommend it. Yeah, well, he's the master at that. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, speaking of this confusing motion for action, you also warn readers to stay away or not confuse excessive studying and research as action. Because I, I think I guess the, the the insidious thing about you know studying and researching it makes you feel like you're doing something, but you actually aren't. Sure, right. So how do you know uh, when you've reached the point where you've learned all you can and you're ready to start actually you know putting rubber meets the road type stuff? Right. You know, if you've got a product that you've got to research and, and get into with a lot of study uh, for the project, you might be wise to have some milestones written down in advance to give you an idea of, of your progress. Beyond that, it just takes practice doing it and kind of a gut hunch. And uh, this is something that I, I have to do myself because every one of these modules in my three books, all 42 of them, each one of these deserves its own book, and many books have been written about any one of these subjects. So how do I know, as an author trying to give you the, the, the short version of it, know when to stop? And that, that, that's a tricky one. At, you know, There's a science to it, the milestones in advance, and then the art, the gut hunch, uh, will come into play later. But then if, if someone really loves to read and research like I do, sometimes <laughs> it can be a very fun vortex to, f to let yourself fall in megabytes of info about this. I, I think that's enough. And I just went through that researching the ribosome, microbiology, nucleic acids and proteins and how they're formed and, and all that in my chapter about evolution. And that is a fascinating vortex. And it, it, I finally crawled my way out of it, but I did. And I think I'm satisfied with, with what I've got. And I think it's going to be <laughs> chapter 33. So yeah, it just takes practice knowing when to stop. Yeah. Yeah. I've often found I can get trapped, especially when you're planning business stuff. Right. Like you want to like yeah. read as much as you can and plan as much as you can. And you have this perfect plan. You're like, okay. And you just end up planning more and planning more. And then when you finally start to take action, you quickly realize that that plan you had pretty much worthless. I mean, like it didn't go according to anything. To yeah. Plan. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But at least you know that. Right. Right. You, you got it. It has to go somewhere else. Yeah. I think it's Eisenhower said that uh, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think the, the, what planning does, it allows you to get your mind around the whole project. And then when things don't go according to plan, you have this, these mental models in your head so you can start adapting on the fly. And that wouldn't have been possible if you didn't do the planning in advance. There's a module right there. You should, you should put that in your, that Eisenhower quote. That's right. In your, one yeah. of your, your books. I could, yeah, I could look into that. You know, it reminds me when I uh, was studying to become a private pilot, you know, it's a very hierarchical, sequential study and your skill set, you know, you start with this and then he adds this and so forth. But aside from that, my own personal research on aviation was 
was very kind of haphazard. I'd basically snarf all the uh, magazines that I could from the terminals. You know, people leave their old copies of AOPA and Pilot and Flying and all that. So I'd ask if, you know, you guys done with this? It looks like you've got plenty of magazines. So I'd take home, you know, scan uh, the, the information that I liked. And so I was learning about aviation in a very random sense, but uh, this mosaic began to fill itself pretty nicely after about a year. And I had a very wide and, and occasionally pretty deep knowledge about flying that I got, you know, from magazines and books. So, but that on top of the, the actual planning and study to, you know, get your pilot's license, I, I think rounded me out pretty well as a young pilot. So another thing that young men or men in general need to learn in order to cope with the world is problem solving. Because once you get into adulthood, you quickly realize that life is just basically solving problem after problem after problem. That's right. And that, That's right. for a lot of young men, that can be daunting and even paralyzing. How do you, how do you suggest young men going, go about categorizing problems to help them move forward with solutions? Well, I guess maybe the first thing is to uh, discern who owns the problem. You know, just because there's a problem and it's in your face, is it your problem or is it someone else's problem that they're trying to put on you? You know, my mom says, who owns the problem? You know, whose property is it? It's not my property. <laughs> That's, that problem is your property. So if it's not your property, then, you know, don't, don't mess with it. Further than that, let's say it is your property. Well, if you can't define it or act upon it, you know, there's nothing to do but forget it. Is it really a problem? You know, can you do anything about it? Is it going to affect you? You know, like weather. I can't do anything about a hail storm except stay out of the hail, you know. But uh, other than that, if you've got to start to deal with a problem, then deal with problems big enough to matter, yet small enough to solve. I read that somewhere, and I think it's a, f a fantastic way to uh, philosophize on this. If a problem's not big enough to matter, then you can forget it. But if it's too big to solve, then what are you going to do anyway? So, you know, get philosophical about what's, what's in your face. If it is big enough to matter and small enough to solve, then, all right, now, now you're on your way to having to deal with something. And the book talks about, you know, the steps in that, especially if they're important problems. The first step would be to separate facts from opinions. Then you define the real problem. Which is, which is often something else, especially dealing with women. You know, they may, may get in your face about something and complaining about A, and A is not bothering them. They're, they're bothered about B. And you've got to know women and know your woman to get to, all right, honey, what's, what's really bothering you? And it'll be something entirely different. Uh, step three, secure evidence on those possible solutions. Step four, weigh the pros and cons of each possible solution. And uh, problem solving is a skill, and you get better with any skill that you practice well. And a, a real man loves problems because, hey, as Ben Carson said, it's, a, it's just a chance to do your best. Do your best. Another opportunity to do your best, yeah. Yeah, I think that one of the biggest challenges, particularly for younger men when they're just starting out in life, is figuring out what is really important. I remember when I was a, a young lad of 18, 19, things that I thought were really big problems, like they weren't really big problems. I made them big in my head, and I spent a lot of time and energy on that. And uh, yeah, as you get older, you start learning how to discern that. Yeah, you get a perspective. I, I would tell young boys I, I once uh, helped raise, I said, look, guys, you know, one, one was like, uh, let's say, nine years old. And I said, look, I know this seems a big to deal to you now. But think of at your school a six-year-old complaining about, you know, a six-year-old kind of problem. You know, you look at him as a nine-year-old going, huh, what a kid, what a punk, what a baby, right? And I said, you know, in a few years, you'll think back on this problem you're having right now at nine as something babyish. So just realize you're, how, however old you are right now, young man, you're going to be older later. So keep, keep a long-term perspective about life. And, uh, you know, the old uh, phrase, in a hundred years, will this even matter? Or even five years, will it even matter to anyone, including yourself? Probably not. And speaking of young men and problems, um, I mentioned this in the book, and I want to mention it on air. Don't be afraid or hesitant to ask somebody for help, especially if the problem is, is new and it hasn't set in. You know, let's say you broke something, you messed up, fess up, you know. Ask dad or mom or, or someone else, look, uh, I kind of did this. 
And most of the time, an adult, a seasoned man will go, yeah, it's, it's kind, of a, kind of a goof, but uh, it's not as bad as you think. And here's how we'll, how we'll, we'll handle it. And it's like, ah, but if you let your problem fester, it may become, become too big for even an adult you know, to handle. And uh, attorneys may have to be called or you know, doctors or, or whoever you know, at the next level. So uh, handle your problems early. And even if you have to ask for help to get out of a jam, just, just do it. Yeah, that asking for help, that can be particularly hard for men because, you know, you want to show independence. Yeah. You know, and show that you can cope with the world. But, you know, it's a learning process. And sometimes you need to, you should try everything yourself, but at a certain point you need to reach out and ask for some help, get some insight. Yeah, asking for help is coping. You know, if, if you're lost, don't don't try to act like the stud in front of your girlfriend driving around aimlessly. Just just pull over and go, hey, looking for such and such. Right. Another problem you tackle in the book that a lot of, not just, I think it's all men at certain points in the life they're going to face, whether you're young, midlife, or older, is getting into a rut. Can you, like, maybe you can share, like, was there a time in your life when you found yourself in a rut? And what did you do to get yourself out of it? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, I think I mentioned it in the book. I, I had a whirlwind uh, college career. I got I got a business BBA in just three years, and it was taking a lot of hours and you know just just studly, you know just rammed right through it. But the, the dean of the business school is just amazed. All my professors thought I was something really unique, and then I graduated, and it's like, well, now what do I do? And I had a year, Brett, of just like, wow. Just, just stunning silence. I hadn't made any plans whatsoever of what to do after my college graduation. And so I might as well have just spent four years, you know, in college and planned for the graduation after that. I would, I would have been, you know, ahead of the game. So, uh, yeah, that was a very black year. And uh, I, I finally just had to pull myself up out of my bootstraps. And, and I went to Europe to a trade show and, and uh, attracted the sponsorship of a business. I was in the motorcycle industry years ago. And so, but you know, even right now, I'm transitioning from very philosophical and uh, political type works with all the Boston Tea Party books I've written, you know, about government and constitution and privacy and guns and so forth. And, you know, for my own self, I pretty much exhausted my interest and my passion in a lot of those subjects. So I'm having to switch gears and, you know, write and think about other things, you know, modules being one of them. So I wouldn't call it a rut, but it's certainly a transition. But yeah, I've got some tips about getting out of the rut. You know, if, if, if you're, if you've got negative emotions or you're bored or you're tired or you're depressed, you know, you've, you've just, you've just got to go do something either for yourself or for somebody else. You just can't wallow in it. If, if you do, cobwebs will start to form on your soul and uh, those cobwebs turn into uh, tethers and then uh, steel aircraft cables. And I see people, and I know you do too, every day that are just walking, walking ruts. And you can tell that they, they've been in that for, for a decade and they ain't getting out. And so realize that this could happen to anyone, especially if you have a, a reversal of fortunes. If your business tanks, guaranteed that you're going to be upright facing the sun all the time. And so you've got to uh, learn how to get up and stay up. And, you know, li life, is, life is work and it's up to you to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, the, the solution is so simple, right? Just, you just got to start doing something. The hard part is actually just doing that thing. And it really is, it's, it, it is a matter, in my experience, when I've been in a rut, it's a matter of just oftentimes just sheer willpower. Right. And just getting you to take that first step. Because once you take that first step, it's like an, an object in motion stays in motion, right? Once you get going, you'll keep going. But it's just that first part, you know, an object at rest stays at rest. You got to really exert a lot of energy to get to get going. That's right. Um, and I know that's, I know a lot of people who are in a rut, they want to hear, oh, there's got to be some kind of hack that I can do. And oftentimes I'm sorry, it's like, no, there's not. Like, you just got to start doing something and uh, the rest will take care of itself. I'll, I'll tell you a good hack if you're depressed. Okay, let's hear uh, it. Is either to work out, do something very physical, because that'll change your endocrinology, get your serotonin levels up and all that. Working out will, will help get over depression. The other thing, if you're depressed or kind of in a funk, go do something nice for someone, especially a stranger. You know, go, go to the senior center and, and help out there or the library or find some way to help out and forget about yourself. Forget about your own damn problems and how sad and miserable you are. Just, you know, act like it's not even you anymore. Just go do something for someone else. And that will make you feel good because you've made other people feel good. So uh, it's not all about you. Get out of yourself. 
You know, that's I, t- I tell myself that. Get out of yourself. Yeah, get out you of know? your head. <laughs> There's other people out there. You're not the only you know one on the planet. Get out of yourself. Right, I love that. Um, you also devote a section to leadership, which is you know every man's going to be a leader at some point in his life. And I thought it was interesting um, in this section for your leadership insight. You went to a um, Spanish. I think he's was he Jesuit. What kind of priest was he? Was he is Balthasar oh, Gracian. Uh, Gracian? Gracian, yeah. Right. That's a fantastic book. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, the was it, the art of worldly wisdom is what it's called, right? That's, that's right. What it's called. Yeah. yeah. Um, what can this set like? I think he's like from the 16th century, 15th century Spanish priest yeah. teach us about being better leaders. Well, he has his book is kind of like uh, Marcus Aurelius's uh, meditations. Uh, just things he wrote to himself over a long period of time, and then it uh, c- concocted itself into a book. And they're they're very small vignettes. I mean, each subject you know gets a paragraph, and the book itself is very tiny. You can get it on Amazon and fit in your back pocket. It it really is a must must thing to have. Um, and I picked out a few things he talked about: let your behavior be fine and noble, common in nothing, uh, have distinction in speech and action prize intensity more than extent to give a, give way in everything or to everyone don't be a bore adapt yourself to your company just just great stuff but a leader is anybody who has followers you know someone could be a leader and not really even know it but if you've got followers you know let's say uh, you've got a couple of younger siblings you're a leader to them they they look at you as as a quasi adult almost and especially if you if if a you know 17 year old uh, boy has a nine year old sister you're you're like a god to her and so if you've got a follower you're a leader and you you better know the extent of, of your influence and uh you know how important it is to 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 act accordingly you know everyone's a leader somewhere so uh and there's an art to it and there's personalities that are much more suited for it you know like the so-called entj and the myers-briggs the field marshal you know, these people are natural born leaders. In my book on the back cover, Robin Olds, you know, 23 years old, this guy was a major in the U.S. Army Air Corps in uh, England and was a squadron commander, P-51 fighter pilots at 23, natural leader. Then went on to uh, be a fighter wing commander in Vietnam and then headed up uh, the U.S. Air Force Academy. You know, so it's just in some, some men to be a leader to someone. So you better know something about it. Yeah. So in your book, in your section about leadership, you you talk about the importance of leaders being good followers, which is counterintuitive because oftentimes the literature on being le- on a good leader, especially like I don't know the, the pop leadership stuff, not not the real. It's just all like no, a leader is like this dynamo. He's charismatic. He doesn't he doesn't submit. He he's he's leading from the front. Um, why do you think? leaders should be good followers? Well, there are some leaders that are kind of born into it like that. And those so-called dynamos were probably dynamos at three and four years old and, you know, since then. And so they've, they've been used to being at the forefront and leading people. And that's one kind of leader. I don't think it's necessarily the best. I think the best leader and the military uh, will support this are the ones who've come through the ranks. Um, I'll give you two examples. The, uh, you know, someone who goes right into uh, officer training uh, school and becomes a second lieutenant who's never been an enlisted man or a non-commissioned officer. And certainly the military is full of those kinds of officers, but what, who the military really values are the so-called Mustangs. And I think uh, Lewis Puller of the Marine Corps, Chesty Puller, is the best example of that. He started out as a buck private in the Marines, you know, back in the I think the 1920s, maybe World War One, and retired as a brigadier general, I believe. And the reason he was such a good officer, especially in World War II in Korea, was that he had been there as a grunt, as a buck private. And so he was really knowledgeable about the needs of his men, and he knew what they were capable of when they were just bitching to bitch about something and when there was a, a real issue that the men couldn't handle. And so he, he understood them inside and out because he had been one. 
Yeah, I love that because that's my, been my experience as a leader. It's whenever I I ask, I, I'm always like, I'm never, I never ask someone to do something that I haven't done myself at some point because I know, yeah, like you said, you get that experience, you know what is possible. And like you said, you know, when someone's just like, oh, I can't do this. Well, no, you can do it. You're just not thinking. And then you can coach them if they come up. Sure. Come to the sure. Parenting is similar to this. Uh, when I was raising a couple of boys with uh, my girlfriend who had children from a, a previous marriage, you know, they would kind of uh, grouse once in a while of why they had to do this or that. And it's not fair. And I said, look, I was a boy myself. I know exactly what you're going through. So, you know, there's, there's no surprises ahead of you that I haven't, you know, experienced myself and grown out of. And this is why I'm here to help, you know, teach you and get you into manhood. So. Right. Well, um, there's a lot of other skills you cover in the book. You talk about self-defense, which I think we talked a little about in the previous podcast we did. You get into economics, you get into time management, but the one skill that I thought was interesting you, you highlight, because after I read this, I was like, okay, I got to do this. Oh, good. I got to do this now. It, it, it's getting your pilot's license. Why do you think every man should go out and get their pilot's license? Well, I mean, since we're on the art of manliness, I mean, the first and most obvious answer is because it's a studly manly thing to do. <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't a man want to fly an airplane? Yeah, you know, that's the simple answer. Uh, to get into it a little more deeply, he uh, experiences a totally new level of dimension of freedom that uh, you can't find anywhere else. Um, I mean, no more TSA blue glove groping him and his family, which I don't understand how any man would put up with that at the airport. Um, you've got the freedom to fly from A to B, and you decide what is A and what is B. You know, instead of having to drive three hours to Denver to, to pick up a big airplane, you know, why don't you fly it out of Grand Junction, Colorado, where you live? Um, and then the other thing that uh, I've, I've really come to enjoy about aviation, and this is something that you don't really read about or your instructor will tell you about, but you have to experience it for yourself as a pilot, is that you've entered into a, a new and higher uh, level of humanity. And that sounds a little elitist, but quite frankly, the barriers of entry to becoming a pilot are high enough that it excludes a lot of people that just you know, will never be there and don't deserve to be there. For example, I just got back from Oshkosh, where 10,000 people fly in with their airplanes. And so, you know, everyone's got phones and tablets and uh, it's, et cetera. And they've got these public charging stations. And instead of just hanging around for an hour waiting for your, your tablet to charge up, you can plug it in and go have a shower or go have breakfast and come back, and it will still be there because you're amongst thousands of fellow aviators and you know quite frankly they, they just uh, operate at a, at a higher level of, of ethics of responsibility and of capability and so for me that's becoming almost as enjoyable and gratifying as the flying itself and is i think a lot of guy, reason why guys don't take that up because they think the the cost is prohibitive is it really that expensive to get your pilot's license uh no becoming a pilot isn't all that expensive especially for what it gives you to get your private pilot license that's above sport pilot which means you can fly something up to gosh i think 12 seat you know aircraft versus only two seats as a sport pilot private pilot license will cost you about ten thousand dollars uh that includes the plane that includes the instructor that includes your books and it will take you about, oh, anywhere from three to nine months, just depending on the tempo of how often you can get to the, to the airfield and uh, get your lessons. Yeah, that's not bad at all. I mean, considering like what you, yeah, what you get. And this is, it, it's definitely an, an investment for sure. Yeah, I mean, that, and I mean, is it, so the process is when you get your pilot's license, there's a, you said there's a sport pilot license and there's a private. Right. Do you, do you have to start off with the sport license and then move to the private, or can you just go right to private? You can start and go right to private. Uh, some people get sport first because it's a little cheaper. It costs you about $6,000, mainly because it only requires 20 hours of dual instruction time versus a minimum of 40 hours as a private pilot. Uh, you are a little limited as a sport pilot. You can only fly uh, one passenger. You can fly only in the daytime. You can't ever have clouds below you. You always have the ground visible below you. And I think you're limited to 10,000 feet. Uh, and also, you usually can't fly into 
big airspace, uh, Class Bravo, which would be uh, LAX, Denver, Chicago, unless I think you have some sort of enforcement. Uh, most people that, that fly routinely fly kind of at the sport pilot level. Um, you know, you don't have that many people with you. You don't fly into you know, big cities. So it would be a good stair-stepping way to get into flying is start with a sport pilot, and then you can always add private pilot later on. And like a plane, is it something you, you own or do you rent one? And if you do own one, how much does it cost to own a plane? The uh, renting versus ownership decision usually is made when someone's flying over 100 hours a year. Below that, if you've got at least a fairly good deal on renting a plane, which is anywhere from 100 to $130 an hour, including fuel, that's basically for a Cessna 172 Skyhawk. It's a four-seater. It cruises about 130 miles an hour for about 400-mile range. Um, if you're flying more than 100 hours a year, the economics make more sense to buy uh, the Skyhawk over the long haul. And you know, a plane like that will cost anywhere from twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars, just depending on uh, age and condition. Gotcha. So you can you can get these used. There's a good used market. Oh sure. In fact, a lot of the planes that are flying uh, aren't made anymore. Uh, Cessna doesn't make their entire line, like the uh, 180 Skywagon, which is a great plane, but they stopped making it in the 70s, I think. So yeah, a lot of what's flying is old. You know, my plane is from the 60s. And a new plane, like a new brand new Skyhawk today, is three hundred thousand dollars. And you can get the the cheriest, you know, nineteen eighty used Skyhawk with nice avionics for uh, you know sixty thousand. You'd have a hard time paying more than sixty thousand dollars for the nicest used Skyhawk. And you're just you know the other two hundred forty thousand dollar premium for a new plane uh, just isn't worth it. But people are catching on the values of, of uh, these older planes. And so the market has kind of bottomed out, but I think it's starting to rebound a little bit, both in the aviation sense uh, and also, you know, national economy may be improving under Trump. So if you want to start flying, this is an excellent time to do it, especially with fuel being, you know, 4 to 450 a gallon for Avgas. Are you seeing more people get their driver's license? I mean, have you seen, uh, since you've had it, have you seen more people kind of enter into that? That domain, I, I statistically that's it's not happening. I, I see people getting into it because I'm I'm at airports and I've talked to pilots. And, you know, I, I name half a dozen people who just got their license in the past year, but that's only because I'm immersed in it. Uh, I think nationally we have fewer pilots every year than the previous year. Uh, we're trying to do a lot to to uh, reverse that. There's a rusty pilot program. A lot of people. Uh, have their license, they're just not current. They haven't flown for you know four years or 40 years. So we're trying to get them back into aviation. And we're also trying to entice the younger generation of the joys of aviation. So we're, we're doing our best and low fuel prices are, are helping because you know when I started to learn how to fly, uh, Avgas was five to six dollars a gallon versus uh, under 450. So the environment's good with low fuel prices and low uh, prices of used airplanes. So uh, I've become sort of an aviation missionary uh, where I, wherever I go. And so a, a guy's best bet in trying to get started with this is just Google their local pilot school? Yeah, if, if you live any you know anywhere near a, a large city, meaning 100,000 people or more, there's almost guaranteed to be a certified flight instructor. Uh, if not several, um, meet all of them because people are people, and you're only going to you know, click with one versus another, and you know find out the reputation of, of uh, these flight instructors versus each other. There's very few bad ones, and you're you're, not, you're not likely not going to to fall into a, a regrettable situation with who, whoever you choose. I mean, I called the first guy out of the book. I liked the sound of his voice. And a uh, nice older gentleman reminding me of my grandfather. And, uh, you know, I, I love the guy. He, he was just wonderful. And so anyone can, can find a good instructor where they live. The main thing is just to get up in the air, at least for an introductory flight, Brett. And after that, boy, if it's in you, uh, it will just take off. That's awesome. Well, Ken, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about uh, your work? I've got a website, uh, javelinpress.com, or all my books are on Amazon, of course. And that's probably the quicker way to get it, especially for Kindle. All my stuff is on Kindle. Uh, so, yeah, Kenneth Royce, uh, Kenneth W. Royce at Amazon is probably the fastest way. I also have a new YouTube channel, uh, Boston Tea Party on YouTube, 
So uh, I've got some excerpts of uh, my older speeches, and I'll be adding more con- content to that very soon. Awesome. Well, Kenneth W. Royce, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure too, Brad. Thanks for what you do. It's a great site and a great mission you guys got, so I'm happy to be a part of it. Like I said, it was Kenneth W. Royce. He is the author of the books, Modules for Manhood. They're available on Amazon.com. You can also check out our show notes at aom.is slash Royce, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.